what are adequate and meaningful ways of thinking about not just our survival, but our thrival, right? Welcome to Curating Tools, a podcast which explores curatorial work through conversations with some of the most prolific curators and art professionals in the creative sector, we aim to provide you with tools and advice to help you develop your curatorial practice. This podcast is brought to you by Call for Curators, a platform promoting professional opportunities since 2012 and Node Center for Curatorial Studies, the first e-learning platform for curators and art professionals founded in 2009. Yeah, let me just start with a little bit of intro. Uh, to you, Sean. So, um, yeah, I'm Maria Zink here and I'm the host of this podcast. And today I'm here with uh, Sean Lee. Hi, Sean. How are you doing? Hi, Maria. Good. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good today. Um, I'm calling in from Glasgow um, and I know you're based in, in Toronto, right? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. On Treaty 13 territory. Great. Um, yeah, thank you for acknowledging that. Um, so Sean Lee is an artist and curator exploring the notion of disability arts as the last avant-garde, uh, orienting, orienting towards a crip horizon. He is interested in the transformative possibilities of crip community, building an, uh, an accessible curatorial practices that desire the ways disability can disrupt. So Sean, can, you, uh, can we start by... Uh, with this this short introduction and can you tell me more about yourself your practice and those who are listening um, yeah just can you tell us a bit more about yourself sure yeah um, so I'm the director of programming at Tangled Art and Disability we're based in Toronto or Tech Toronto also called um, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the credit. We're on Treaty 13, which is um, the, a treaty between the Mississaugas of the credit and the Canadian government. Um, and Tangled is a disability art um, and culture organization. I like to think of it as um, a site for political engagement with disability arts. Um, we're a space that operates um, an art gallery that's dedicated to exhibiting uh, the work of mad, deaf, disabled artists, as well as advancing accessible curatorial practices. And I like to think of us as a space that uh, engages with what it means to um, orient towards disability culture, you know, thinking of disability as um, a space that we all share and disability as a way of being that has shared cultural practices and meaning and, you know, a, 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 something that we can dwell and desire rather than try to eliminate. Um, so the work that I do as an artist and as a curator is oftentimes about um, <clears throat> challenging the ideas around disability that currently sort of prevail in our mainstream society and instead think about some of the ways that um, disability arts helps us to rethink and rebuild the world in kind of more expansive and more nuanced ways, particularly like orienting towards um, a crip um, sort of horizon, if you will, you know, thinking constantly about how it is that we can move towards a, a culture, a space, a society that is kind of more open to the disruption of disability. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I alongside my um, alongside my position at Tangled, um, I also do independent curation. I, I teach and um, I'm a board member as well at uh, Carfac Ontario, which is um, a, a representation kind of organization for artists here in Ontario. And I'm also on the board of the Toronto Art Council. Um, I'm on a number of advisories and a lot of my work is about, you know, how can we think about access? How can we think about disability arts as telling um, stories different from sort of what's been prevailing in our, um, in the mainstream kind of, if you will. The width and breadth of your 
um, and depth of your practice is is really impressive and not only tangled but yeah as you mentioned all these other activities that you're engaged with um, and as you said the space of disability arts is a very political space and I think um, you know as we're here today to also talk about um, the course that you're teaching the inclusive curatorial practices accessibility representation and diversity you're teaching a module on this course at Node um, you know I think uh, let's start with one question kind of a broad question these it seems simple the simple questions are usually the most difficult and you know um, i was preparing for this conversation and i um, watched your talk with uh, yinka shonibara where um, he mentioned uh, who's a fantastic artist for anyone listening um, there will be links in the description but please check check his work um, and yinka mentioned that artists with disabilities, I'm paraphrasing here, artists with disabilities can achieve uh, the same amazing things as artists who do not have disabilities and all they need is access. So can we start by discussing access? What is access to you? As a curator? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's such an interesting question because I I'm always thinking about how I can continue to push my idea of what access is, right? And Yinka, um, in that conversation with Yinka, who's so brilliant and just such an incredible artist, I, what I really loved was that Yinka has, um, in 2007, Yinka was part of a panel where he was discussing disability arts. And he sort of very boldly proclaimed that disability arts is the last remaining avant-garde movement, you know, and it, it sort of follows up on his, um, his, his observation that the emerging and growing momentum of disability arts, the disability arts movement sort of paralleled the emergence of movements like the feminist arts movement, black arts and queer arts movements in the 60s and 70s that were all very powerful, similarly, you know, powerful vehicles for social change. And um, when, when we were talking about this idea that disabled artists need access, um, you know, it really was access, playing off this idea of what access is, right? A lot of times we have these ideas that um, <clears throat> access is about compliance. Access is about um, a certain minimum standard that we have to um, achieve or conform to. And I think the, the, the reason for this is because historically access has been a part of the disability rights movement. And the disability, and this is, sorry, this is kind of a long <laughs> ramble, but the, no, the no, dis I think that having the background, you know, of what uh, disability arts movement and, you know, maybe disability justice is, uh, would be, would be great. Yeah, please, please continue. <laughs> Yeah, well, as, as as I was saying, you know, the 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 reason access is so often sort of um, brought into these narrow understandings is because, you know, in the 60s and the 70s in Western culture, you know, in the U.S., in Canada um, in particular, there was kind of this inspiration by the great civil rights movements of the time um, and disabled folks looking to the other movements really began to question why so many people with disabilities were institutionalized and isolated and excluded from participating in um, in our social sectors. And so the at the time, you know, things like a disability act hadn't been passed. And so the world was largely entirely inaccessible to um, crip folks. Mm -hmm. And so the conversations that, be, that began were very radical. You know, they were in, about interrogating society's assumptions about, you know, what disabled people can or can't do and how we, sh we as disabled folks should live. And so when we as a disability community began to gather and began to, you know, organize, it was about challenging the exclusion and the lack of choice, you know, all the discrimination that disabled folks faced. And this was sort of the beginning of the disability 
dis disability rights movement, which was a real turning point in Western culture that advocated for disability to be recognized as a human rights issue and a legislative issue. So, and so how did that get to mm -hmm. that was through access, right? It was, it was the, the disability rights movement um, was really about how can we create access so people can get through the door. And ultimately, you know, because we live in a capitalist world, the, the, the notion of access sort of got watered down and trickled down as it went through, you know, the legislative process. And so in order to, you know, get buy-in, for instance, um, disability rights was passed through, you know, the language of accommodation. And, you know, it was justified through, you know, at the time, injured war vets returning from the Vietnam War and politicians sort of gained traction for disability rights through this lens of rehabilitation. How can disabled people also be contributing members of society? And so access was sort of um, focused around like A, the physical ways that disability could be sort of mm -hmm. mitigated in society so that um, so that people could become quote unquote independent and economic and political citizens. And so access in this sort of manifestation under the terms of capitalism were oftentimes through these checkbox approaches. It was about how can we bring people through the door, you know, into the building. And it very often didn't think about what were we bringing people into? What are adequate and meaningful ways of thinking about not just our survival, but our thrival, right? And so access to me is actually kind of very, very much not about just, just how can we get people into the door? How can we include people, you know, into a society that doesn't work for most of us. But instead, access is about taking like a very critical approach towards how it is that we think about this society that's allowed people to be excluded, to be, you know, falling through the gaps in this way. And so for me, access is sort of part of disability culture. How can disability culture really think about a whole different way of um, living in our body minds, you know, that, that, uh, Leia Lakshmi Piepsna Sumar Singha, who's an incredible disability, um, writer and activist kind of talks about how, you know, how do you know you're just dis doing disability justice? How do you know you're doing access work? And it's, it's because nothing will ever go right. You know, not the, the, there, there's no one size fits all solution. And that, disability is oftentimes too wild to fit into the industrial complexes that we've sort of been taught um, to, to operate in. So for me, access is part of a tool. It's, it's part of a host of cultural practices that we can use to take up this sort of never finished project to build new practices, to build different ways of navigating the world, really. And, and I think it's full of political potential when it's brought on with um, by disabled folks to kind of think about a different world. You know, it's about it's about sort of world building and world dismantling towards yeah. sort of a more um, just and equitable way of experiencing culture. And that's through access and it's it can access can take on so many different different meanings and different understandings and it's constantly um it, yeah, it's constantly sort of being um challenged and and it's constantly challenging like what it means to participate in in culture so I, I think I, I answered your question by sort of giving this long story of why I can't can't really answer it <laughs> If you want to listen to the full episode, sign up for the Call for Curators membership, which gives you access to exclusive content, online events, and most importantly, to our weekly selection of top art opportunities from all across the world. Sign up now via the link in the description and try the Call for Curators membership for free for one week. Membership prices start at only 2.95 euros per month.